Welcome everyone to this Force Friday. Uh, today we have a very exciting subject for you, one that I come across quite often and I've seen again as an issue across many different schools in the past that I've taught at in their curriculums. And that is how to combine form with, uh, with force, right? Like how do, you, how do you get form in there and not lose all the energy, right? Like, you know, you go from gesture drawing and you got all this like action and dynamism going on in your work. And then you start dealing with construction and prim primitives and the stuff just doesn't want to work, right? Like you end up killing your drawing. So that's what we really want to watch out for today. And we're going to teach you like how to get that construction, really manipulate it, right? So uh, before we do so, uh, let's say hello to our instructors. Um, if MJ's rolling in right now. Uh, how you doing, Swanley? Yeah, good. Like I said, I think this is an interesting subject. And I'm so glad that my first formal art education was industrial design, where they yep. drilled us into this stuff. You know, so I think it's it's something that's easy to underestimate. Like students often like skip this stuff and want to go right to the figure, and then everything is flat. So you need to spend your time with the primitives to be able to relate the figures to these basic forms. Yeah, and I, I would dare say, you know, if a student knows how to draw structure, sometimes we get students that know how to draw structure and they come to the website. So we still have to backpedal our way out of that a little bit in order to teach them form. I mean, not form, force first. And, um, you know, because of that, uh, you have to, um, you have to try to keep these things alive. Sorry, my dog like just jumped in and there's like construction going on right outside of the studio. Uh, and then he like opened the door and everyone outside was like, because <laughs> they all know who I'm on right now. Um, and I lost my train of thought. So my point here is uh, we'll get students that already know form, like yourself, right? So you went through form first uh, and we backpedal to get force back in there. And then we can kind of reintroduce form, right? And understand like, how does that actually work? How do these two things combine? That's, that's what today is about. So if you're here today, what we're gonna teach you how to do is understand how to take those structures and make sure that they stay alive. You know, uh, We're gonna also give you a brief overview of how to build those structures. That's really important for those of you that don't know, um, you know perspective and forms and primitives. We're gonna cover that stuff today, give you some really quick, very powerful uh, tricks on how to do so. And then how to take those forms and boom, you know, step them up a notch and get um, get force into them, right? Like, what are the tricks to do that? And I think, you know, what we're going to find today is we're going to discover that there are certain forms that are closer to forceful forms than others. And how do you manipulate it? How big is that manipulation or not, right, to get there? And that they're really, in the end, becomes the favorite, I think sort of a favorite shape slash form that works really well with, with the force drawing approach. And, you know, I use this often, you know, and you'll see, right, you'll see where this all goes. So I'm very, very excited to share this all with you. I think it's a super important subject. And uh, let's get to it, right? So let's see, let me get back to Photoshop here. Um, I mentioned this last week, and I want to reiterate this because this will only be for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we are having a huge mentorship sale right now. So if you're new here or you're not aware of this, Wenli, Mutunja, and I, all three of us mentor on drawingforce.com. What does that mean? That means they're one-hour sessions, usually more like 50, 55 minutes, right? Because we have to get ready for the next student. Uh, these like one-hour-ish sessions uh, with you guys one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's like a doctor appointment or a therapist appointment, right? <laughs> so you can sit down with us and... Uh, and we teach you, right? And it's private and you get, uh, you know, individualized, personalized art instruction. Because of that, uh, you have one of us actually guiding you through curriculum. And I just think it's super powerful. You know, I, again, I would not be here today if it wasn't for the mentors that I had, the teachers I had in school, the people who mentored me after I left school. Uh, yeah, super powerful. You know, there's no faster way, honestly, to learn than that. I could say that very honestly and hands down, that, that is the fastest way for you to learn, right? Is to have somebody help you and guide you that's already been through all this stuff. And that goes for anything. It's not just drawing. It could be anything, right? Fast, you want to learn how to ski? Go and find a pro skier, 
right? And have them take you through what he or she does, right? That's the fastest way to do it. So now the sale, the sale is about this, which is you want to use uh, the coupon Force Holiday 12 or Force Holiday 36. So on the 12, that's a 12 package of sessions that gives you $200 off. And if you do the 36 session one, it's almost $1,000 off. It's like $885, $900, somewhere around there, right? So I don't think I've given that big a discount um, ever. So yeah, now's the time, right? We're trying to prep ourselves for next year. We want to inspire you guys to come in and you know grow in 2023 as artists and try to accomplish your own goals. And we're very excited to try to help you with that, okay? All right. Um, you know, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, or you can always email me at mike at drawingforce.com. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. So perspective is where I want to start today. I'm not going to make a massive thing. You know, we have videos on perspective and all, right? I, I just want you to be aware. You have to know this, right? I bring this up. I teach four point or the three of us, I should say, teach four point perspective. And the reason for that, again, is because uh, it represents the human eye, you know? I've been I've been using four point for thirty years now, and it it works for me. Like I get it. I get the I get the shortcomings of it. I get the strengths of it, and how to really use it and help it, you know, work for me. Uh, and the way it represents the human eye is this is the circle of your eye, and here's your pupil. Let's say, right? And you can see that things bow out in the center at the crosshairs, and they pinch down at these vanishing points, the points all around the peripheral, right? So these are our vanishing points, right? There's like vanishing point one, two, uh, three, and four, right? And one very simple rule I can share with you today that is a trap that I find students fall into uh, when they're using the grid is this is a relatively hard line, the, um, uh, the horizon line. What I mean by that is if you draw a box in the top half, like so, uh, let's go up actually a little higher, like so. All right, so here's a here's a box. First of all, it's not like every line has to land on an extension line, right? You can look at extension lines like this one and this one and kind of average out and go, oh, you know, if I wanted another line in there, I'd be here or here or here. You'll see how lines like gradate, right? It's like a fan. And this angle slowly changes over the distance of the screen or the piece of paper. That's really perspective. Perspective is this game of angles and how these angles relate to one another compared to where that vanishing point is that defines those angles, right? That vanishing point is like a push pin, right? It's like you're sticking a string in there, right? And you're pulling that string out and then you're just going up and down with it. And that height change creates all these different angles, right? So anyway, the rule I wanted to get to was if a box is above this horizontal line, I know some of us call it horizon line, we call it eye lines, it's got lots of terms. I'm calling it horizontal here, by the way, just to be even more PC about it in a sense, because what happens in outer space, <laughs> right? There is no horizon line, but guess what? There's still perspective. So what does that mean? How does that work, right? So to finally get to the trick, um, if an object is above this horizontal line, then it must use the vanishing point above for the vertical lines of the box. You'll see how they're all pinching up that way. You can't do this. This is the trap students fall in. They'll draw a box over here and they'll use the vanishing point below. Now my extension lines already show you that I stopped them. I didn't cross, so it's a little easier, but sometimes students go all the way up, right? And they fall in this trap and they do something that looks like this. You see? So these lines are now going down. So no good, right? Because it's above me and I'm looking up, it should vanish upward. If it's below me, I'm gonna be looking down at it. Here, let's draw one below. All right, then I'm looking down at it, right? So with me looking down at it, it's going to vanish downward away from me, you see? So just keep that in mind. You don't wanna cross this line. Now, does it ever happen? Sure. You can never say never, right? I've seen buildings, you know, where I would do this and say, you know what, the vanishing point is below and that works fine. But there's only a certain amount of grace period or distance that you have before you have to really bend this and say, you know what, I, I have to start dealing with the top point. You know, it's like now I've got a four point perspective box. Let's say this is a building. 
right? Very tall building. And you can see it's going to look something like this. And that does happen, right? You could have a fisheye lens and be in a city and take photographs and they're out there on the internet. You can look them up. You know, you'll find this, right? So you got to have the grid, all right? No way around it. You got to learn the grid. Why? Because the grid teaches you this game of angles. You start to really recognize the rules and what looks right and what looks wrong, okay? And we want to get past that because the next step is us getting rid of the grid. And once you get rid of the grid, it's like getting rid of the crutches and you want to fall on your face, right? It's like, how do I stand this up without the grid? So let's talk about that next. So at drawingforce.com and in a mentorship, we teach students how to go through this process. And we have like lots of different assignments and I'm just giving you a couple of them today, okay? So here's a box, right? So now we're on a box. Right, very typical, like, uh, you know, almost isometric three quarter view box. It's like the quintessential box. Okay. I'm not worried about it being a cube per se. It almost is really, but I, I didn't do that on purpose. That's fine. I don't care if it's a cube. Cube meaning it's got all, you know, it's squares, right? It's got all the same sides, uh, same measurements, right? So it's like a, it's a, you know, it's a square in perspective, right? Um, there's a few things I did here that are very, very specific that I want to call out. Okay, my first piece of advice at learning how to create this box is in a weird way, I wanna kind of invert this yin yang of this. Instead of thinking about drawing the box, think about drawing angles, right? Remember I've been saying in the perspective grid, this is really a game of angles, okay? So um, that's why what I did was I overextended um, its edges, right? So over, Overextend. In essence, what we're doing is we're we're in a sense creating those extension lines, right? <laughs> so we're over we're creating these extension lines. Okay, um, I'm laughing because I just I keep picturing everybody's face when the door open. They're all like, <laughs> and that's the face I made. Now all I was doing was like impersonating them. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Anyway. Um, so what I mean by that, what do I mean? This, see this? What students do here typically is they'll come in with a box that looks like this, right? Where it's just to the corners, you see what I mean? And it's okay to get there, but, and we wanna get there, but I think it's better, it's a better way, the better way to learn this is by doing what I'm doing here where these lines are longer than the box itself. Why is that? because we just left the grid, right? We left the grid. And now that we left the grid, I want you to be aware of the grid without drawing the whole grid, right? So let me get rid of this box and redraw it. So I start doing this. I'm like, well, I wanna start drawing this top surface, right? So I've got an angle like this. If it's longer and I have this line, what I'm really doing in my mind is I'm picturing the grid without drawing the grid, right? So I know there's a vanishing point somewhere up there to screen right. And then I draw another line like this, and I know there's another vanishing point up to screen left. So I've already determined I'm looking down at this box, right? Because of this angle, there's gonna be a surface here, okay? Now, these are what I call parents here. I'll draw all three. There's three main parents, right? So these are turning edges. Turning edges are the edges within the box, right? Turning edges, D, G, E, S, edges. So these are turning edges, okay? And I'm gonna call these turning edges uh, parents. So let's bring in the children, right? The children are the contours, right? The edges. Contours are children. Okay, like so. So let's draw some children. Now, the children want to get to the house. I call the vanishing point. So the VP is up here somewhere, right? This is home, right? So the parents and the children are to, trying to converge on the house, right? 
So now that we have this going this way, right, what we want to do is get a child in there. Now, in the least, the, the best of the worst is to stay parallel, like so. So the kid never gets to the house. He goes in the same direction. He's following along with the parent, and they just never really connect, okay? They kind of get into the area of the house, but they never really get in there together, right? Be that's better than not getting there at all, right? So not getting there at all. Here, let's draw a really bad box, right? I'm going to have this child go this way, okay? And then down here is going to be the other child for that point, right? That kid normally parallel looks like this, right? So not too bad. But going off the rails, right, this child would go away from the parent like so, right? So here, I'll draw the rest of the box with everything being correct, all right? Notice this child is going to make its way to that parent, and this child is going to make its way to this parent, right? They're going to end up up here somewhere. Now let's do the verticals, right? I have this parent here. I'm going to squeeze in a little bit. So this child's going to meet up. I'm going to squeeze in a little bit. This child's going to meet up. Wow, look at that box, right? One family off course, two children that decided I'm not going home, <laughs> right? And with just those two children, we have this totally wonky box, right? Let's fix one of them. Right, so let's fix this bottom guy here. So I fix this up. Remember, here's the parent, there's the angle, right? So parallel, not too bad. You can see that starts fixing this box up. I'm gonna slightly bring them up, right? Like so, okay, look at that. Everything is fixed now, except for this one line. One line, right? One line is still ruining this box, right? One child is just veering off course. Right. And all three families, right, can't or aren't able to, you know, create this box for us because of this one child just taking off. Right. So what we want to do is fix that last angle. Right. So all we got to do again, parallel like this. Right. So much better. Right. So much better. But I'm going to squeeze them in just a little bit towards the parent, like so. And there, look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> Right. All of a sudden it's like, ah, it feels good. It works. You know, otherwise it feels like the, the pee in, under the mattress. You know, it's like this little annoying thing. It's like, ah, there's something wrong with this box. So I call this whole process that I just showed you families. Right. This is my metaphor for learning perspective. It's one of many, but I, this is probably my favorite one. Not only is it a good way to learn how to draw the perspective, uh, it's a good way to fix perspective. Maybe you have a box you've already drawn. And you know something's wrong with it, but you don't know what it is. Well, you know what? Go check the parents, right? Make sure that they're all clearly going towards their homes and make sure all the children that are supposed to go to those homes compared to that parent are going in the right direction, right? And then immediately we'll click things in, okay? So after this, right? This is a great place to get to, okay? But all I did was draw one three quarter view box and just showed you how to fix it. And I gave you a tool to fixing it, right? After this, what we do is we say, okay, let's see how good you really get this. Um, we want you to rotate this box, right? There's lots of ways of rotating. Um, the two main ones, I'll give you the two main ones really quick here. Uh, one is you can go off of a corner, right? So you have this corner and you really have to look at what the, what the positive space is here, so this is the positive, versus let's say the negative space here, this is the negative. And they'll typically like match up, right? Because you're dealing with like a 45 degree angle then if they were equal on 45s on either side it would match up. If I wanted to turn it, for instance, I might have a box that looks like this. Here's the turning edge, right? That close turning edge. Here, let me get rid of that line so it doesn't confuse us, right? So if I made the negative really narrow down here, that means the negative here would, I mean, the positive here would be really narrow. You see that? So now I can draw like the rest of the box. And then that's how you get these boxes that have like these really narrow sides and try to make sense of them. And then I can go back in and pinch this a little bit more if I want, right? Give it a little bit more perspective, but there's this box, right? So you're really playing with the idea of like, what does 180 degrees equal? You know, what? what is 90 degrees on one side equal versus the other 90 on the other? And how's that getting split up, right? It's like pull out the protractor, <laughs> right? And figure this whole thing out, okay? So that's one way, right? It's like this turning edge on this axis, right? And you're like kind of pivoting the box on it. 
most of the time I, I personally don't really use that, but I think it's a good exercise to go through to just see how that mathematically works. I think it's a really good thing to do, okay? So that's number one. The second one, um, the second option, it's really about like where you're turning from, by the way, right? So we covered that one, that's the corner. Right. The second one is to to rotate from an axis within the box. Right. So let's try the new color here. Um, that would be, let's say, the centers. Right. So here's the center of the box on the on the uh, on the y. Right. On the y axis. So it would rotate like this around this ellipse of that box. Right. Then we could say this is the x axis. Right. It's like this. Right, it would rotate around that ellipse, and then last but not least, we would have let's say the y axis I mean, the uh, z axis. Sorry, right, and it would be like this, right? So, this would be z, z and x are kind of interchangeable, right? Z and x, and then you'd have y, right? So, you have these three axes, and being able to rotate that box on those axes. So, you want to learn how to do that, right? And I usually suggest doing one axis at a time. And then trying to do maybe two axes at a time and then three where you're like free forming it right and really trying to understand you know how to get to a place like that in fact let me show you really quick here i'm going to pull this out of my mentorship um my mentorship folder of examples that we show in the classes here's a video that uh that we can watch. So this is a good example of, of that. Let's see, new share. See, this is student's work, right? And this is like multiple axes at one time, you see? So that's, that's like the ultimate skill in this, right? If you can do that, then you can draw structure. You can draw the body and understand construction. You're really getting a great sense here of the integrity, right? The integrity of the corners and try to how to hold form correctly, you see? So that's, to me, this is always extra bonus points if someone actually animates the box, right? Pretty darn amazing. Not, like I said, not an easy task to do. Okay, so let's go back to Photoshop. So, you know, how would you do that? You know, you could, there's, I don't want to go into this too much because this is really the assignment today. And I think we've covered this, but you know, you can use that ellipse and create sort of check marks, almost like a clock has its, you know, its hours. And you can kind of rotate the corners around each one of those axes and like take your time doing so. Um, and finally, then therefore now understand not only how to draw the grid, the grid teaches you how to draw the box. You start freehand box drawing, you try to rotate the box, and then you can turn that box either on its turning edge axis or you can turn it on the um, on the center axis, right? Like one of the two, okay? All right, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Swenley. All right, you ready, Swenley? Yes, thank you, Mike. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so thank you, Mike, for this uh, wonderful introduction about four point and the free end box. So the next step would be uh, constructing uh, primitives or what we call basic forms from the freehand box. Now, I must say, just like Mike mentioned earlier, this is just a quick overview of what we teach. It's it's a lot. Like we normally spend a couple of weeks. I mean, if I look back, I spent a good couple of years, like at least eight years or so, practicing this stuff constantly to to master it. So this is an overview. Don't expect to get it in one shot. You really need to spend time practicing this basic stuff. So once you have the freehand box, um, the next step is to construct primitives. Now, what is important is to keep the box as close to a cube as possible, because especially once you start dealing with, with ellipses and, and, and the sphere, if the box is a rectangular box, then you're going to get an X shape. And maybe in some cases, that's what you want. But if you want a sphere, then you need something that's very close to a cube. So we're going to work with this basic cube right here on the screen left. 
And the first thing that we're going to construct, the most easiest uh, basic form is the pyramids, because it's just basically uh, taking the, the, the basic uh, or the base plane of the cube and then connecting those corners to the center of the top plane. Now, how do you find that center? That would be the next question. And it's actually pretty easy. Uh, it works the same way in perspective as in a flat view. So what you basically do is you take the four corners of the uh, of the plane, and then you uh, you connect them with the letter X. You know, so you can see like this X going here, and that's where those um, two lines intersect. That is that gives you the center of the plane. And once you have that, so you start with, with the letter X first to give you the center. And if you want the center of the, uh, of the edges, then you have, to, uh, you have to draw a cross. You know, so you start with the letter X to find the center and then the cross through that X give you, gives you the center of, uh, of the edges. So this is very important because this is what we're going to use uh, also to construct the ellipses later on. So again, very important to um, remember and practice uh, this little trick here to find the centers of, uh, of the plane and the edges. So once we understand that construction, then the pyramids, again, pretty easy. All we have to do is draw that X in the top plane of the box that gives us the center. And then we take the four corners of the, of the base of that cube. And then we extend the lines and we connect those corners to the center of the top plane. And that gives us the pyramids. Now, so again, pretty easy. That's the simplest one. Once you understand how to draw the freehand box. Now, after the pyramids, we can go to one that is a bit more complex, which is the cone. And for the cone, again, similar to the pyramid in that we need the center of that top plane. But with the cone, we start dealing with, with the ellipse. And there are certain rules to construct the ellipse properly. Now, I always tell students that perspective is actually pretty easy in the sense that if you learn the rules and you apply them, it works. And if you don't, it doesn't, you know, so it's that black and white. So let's look at some uh, ellipse rules. Now, there are, sir, there are uh, different aspects of the ellipse that we must understand. First of all, we need to understand the, uh, the width of the ellipse. Now, if since we're dealing with a with a box, which if we take that uh, cube, I would I would say in front view, the cube would be a square. Of course, it's it's equal equal dimensions. So, if we're dealing with a square, uh, let's zoom in a little bit here. That means that if we take the front view of that uh, of that cube, that would be a square. That means that in a square is a circle. Now, if we start rotating the box, let's say to the screen left, and we are still looking at the front plane with a circle in it, notice that as the box rotates away from us more, the circle visually starts uh, squashing and, and it becomes an ellipse. Now, so there's still a circle in perspective, but because of the camera angle, it starts appear appearing as an ellipse. And now we can see it here in perspective, the same. So we're looking, we're looking down at the box. Now, here we have a circle. And as we start rotating that box, notice that that circle is starting to squash and become an ellipse. So the, um, when you're drawing the ellipse, the width of the ellipse is important because depending on how wide or narrow you draw that ellipse that tells us um, how the force, the uh, the form, I should say, is is oriented in a three D space. You know, so the wider it is, the more it's facing us until it's like a uh, perfect circle facing us straight on. And the more you rotate 
um, that circle on that plane in 3D space, the narrower it's going to get. So that is number one. The width of the ellipse is important. And then uh, after we understand that, the ellipse itself, it represents a circle in perspective, but the ellipse itself can be regarded as a flat shape. Like it is a flat shape, you know, which means that we can we can divide it in halves across its, its length and across its width. And that gives us two axes, and they are respectively referred to as the major and minor axis. Uh, minor, of course, being the, the shortest distance and major being the longest one. And the reason that th why this is important is because uh, we're going to use the, uh, the minor axis primarily to make sure that the ellipse um, is uh, drawn correctly uh, in on the plane of the box, which we'll look at next. So how do we do that? First of all, we need to find the central axis of the form. And the central axis is the axis that goes right through the form. You know, like if you take a stick and uh, put it right through the center of that box, that gives you the central axis of the, for the uh, form. It's like the, uh, the axis of a wheel of a car, for example, that goes right through the center. So whether it's a box or a cylinder, the central axis is the axis that goes right to the center. And then we have to make sure when we draw the ellipse that the minor axis of the ellipse, the shortest, uh, the shortest one, uh, lines up with that central axis. If we don't, we're going to get some weird distortions, which means, so let's say uh i draw an ellipse on the cylinder but i draw i draw the ellipse like this for example you know now all of a sudden notice that the ellipse if i draw the major axis the longest one it's not it's not 90 degrees to uh, the central axis of the form anymore so that is going to give us some um, weird distorted uh, cylinders so the um, another way to look at it is the the major axis, the longest one, needs to be ninety degrees to the central axis of the form. Again, if you if you tilt this axis, either way, if you tilt it this way, you're going to get some weird distortions. You know, it's going to look like some kind of squashed uh, cylinder. So make sure that the ellipses are always. Uh, 90 degrees of perpendicular to the central axis of the form. Now that we know that, we can go to um, actually building that ellipse in a plane. So again, here we have a plane now in, uh, in perspective, meaning that the parallel lines are going to meet at, at a vanishing point at a distance. You know, same for same for these guys. They meet in a vanishing point out there, up here. And we use our um, uh, method that we saw earlier to construct or find the center of the plane. So we take the four corners, we draw the letter X, and that gives us the center. And then we can draw the cross, which gives us the center of the edges. And the uh, the green line here is the central axis, so the axis that goes right to the center of that plane. And this takes some understanding of perspective to be able to visualize that that uh, that axis properly. So again, this takes a bit of practice to uh, to learn it. And of course, as you draw boxes, as you draw them in the grids, like Mike said earlier, it trains your eyes to see this perspective angles and you get used to what looks right and what doesn't so central axis so yeah, keep in mind that quick. yeah sure yeah one thing one um one mistake i see that happens very often is uh how do i put this so let's say i have a plane here and it's like this and you know you do the x as as Swanley was saying right it's like this to this right um 
when you want to get to those ellipses to Swenley's point, you have to get these other lines in here, like, you know, like this one and this one, right? And a mistake that students make is they get here, they'll get the cornering right, but they don't find that right angle for these lines that split the, the surface in half, right? So for instance, I have to look at this angle, I'm gonna elongate it to make it more obvious, right? So it's like this, right? And then all of a sudden they'll do this. As soon as you do that, game over, right? Because it's not the middle anymore. Look at the, the length of this distance here. This is too high, it's too close to the top, right? It's not in the middle. So this angle, that new angle I drew really has to be a gradation, right? It has to be the true center of this and this line, right? So that means it's gonna be, let me see, oh yeah, I can back out. So it's gonna be like this. You see how that looks like it's in the middle now? That lands me here and here, right? And then I have this line and I have this line. So I have to get another one here through the center, through the X, right? Center of the X and yet still have it be the same angle. That happens all the time. It's probably the most common mistake I see in this whole thing is they get to that X and they start putting those center lines and they're out of whack. And I'm like, no, 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 this has to be in the middle between the two edges of the plane or <laughs> the ellipse does not work, right? Otherwise you're giving yourself the wrong anchor points in the centers, right? All right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for adding that. That's indeed something that students do a lot and then it amplifies once they go drawing the head, for example, you know, like the forehead is at an angle and the nose is at a different angle the chin is at a different angle and everything gets distorted. And that comes uh, due to a lack of spending time with these exercises and getting them right. So indeed you want to watch those angles. And once we have that central axis, then we can draw, we can draw the ellipse, you know, so the ellipse has to be uh, perpendicular or like 90 degrees to the central axis and it has to touch the uh these four corners you know and you can use a soft brush if you want and just uh like soft touch that ellipse in there you know you don't have to get it right in one line you now just take your time to to practice that ellipse and as you build up your skill you'll be able to hit it more accurately in one shot but you want to make sure that the ellipse is 90 degrees to the central axis very important so with that, we can go to uh, finally build uh, the cone. So again, we find the uh, the central axis of the form, which goes right to the center. And then we use the construction that we just looked at to, um, to find the center or actually find the center of the, the edges of the, uh, of the bottom plane. And now we all have all the information that we need to build the ellipse. So the next step then would be to draw the ellipse, you know, so actually I think if we, if we rotate the page, we can see that more clearly. So notice again that the ellipse is, is 90 degrees to the central axis of the form, you know, so the central axis of the form got that, got that ellipse exactly in half across its shortest distance. Now, again, very, very important. If you don't get that right, it's going to look distorted, guaranteed. So once we have the ellipse, pretty much like the pyramid, the next step would be to simply connect uh, the extremities of the, uh, of the ellipse to the top center of the form. And then we have the cone. And then for the cylinder, Similar to the cone, we just need to uh, draw the ellipse on the top plane as well. Again, make sure that it's um, it's uh, 90 degrees to the central axis of the form. And then you just connect the extremities of the ellipses with, uh, with a straight line. And then you have... this we have the sphere so for the sphere um we basically need at the minimum we need uh two cross sections we need first of all i pick the uh the central uh this is the uh, the vertical center plane 
of the um, of the of the box. You know, I used of course the same method that we saw earlier. I just left out the guidelines for clarity's sake. Watch well, you draw the X, you dot the cross, and that gives you that gives you the centers. You know, so you do that for the bottom plane as well. And then you can connect those four points, and that gives you the vertical center plane of the uh, of the box. And then we can draw an ellipse on that plane. And then you can pick the horizontal center plane. Again, use the construction, get the ellipse, and that leads you to uh, to this right here. You know, and I remember my industrial design teacher used to tell us to uh, really stay focused and pay attention because when you start adding more guidelines, especially on paper, it can become hard to see what you're doing. But since we're working digital, we can use different colors and different layers that makes it a lot easier. So now we have two cross sections. We have the uh, the vertical cross section and the horizontal cross section of the uh, of the sphere and all we have to do is contain the uh, the extremities of those two ellipses again with a uh, with a circle uh, keep in mind the silhouette of a sphere has to be close to a uh, as close to a perfect circle as you can get and then you have it you know just takes a lot of a uh, bit of practice to make sure that you don't like lose track of all the construction and once you have the sphere, we can again take the, the central axis um, of the box, which would go right through the center of that sphere. And we can use that to, uh, to draw more elliptical cross sections on the sphere. You know, and of course, the ellipses would stay within the extremities of the silhouette of that sphere. So, um, that's basically it for the uh, for the basic forms. Again, don't think that you'll get this overnight. It takes a bit of practice, especially if this is all brand new. So take your time, you know, practice this, uh, let's say a little bit daily, even if it's like half an hour uh, daily. And with practice, it will become second nature. You can start relating it to the figure, which um, Ritunji is going to uh, talk about next. Are you ready, Mitunjay? Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, hello, guys. <laughs> I'm able to, able to get in. Can you hear me? Yeah, how's it going? Yeah, going good. Okay. Breaking Zoom. No, it doesn't allow me to get in. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. Uh, you got to give me the power now. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. First Zoom and now me. <laughs> it's not letting Mitunjay in. Here we go. Co-host. There you go. Okay. Screen share. All right, guys. No camera today. I'm just gonna be behind the man. I know behind the behind the, the curtain. curtain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh all right, guys. So uh let's bring it all together. Okay. So now we have this knowledge of like primitives, you know, like, and, and we call them primitives, by the way, you know, we are talking about this, like whether to call it primitives or like basic forms and, and the primitive, uh, the word is actually not as like well known, you know, <laughs> everybody call like these, uh, like basic forms, like basically the cube and the sphere and the cylinders. Uh, so anyway, like now we have that kind of knowledge um, and now we know how to insert them and like move them around into space. Uh, but that doesn't do everything, okay? That doesn't do everything because the silhouette is the main stuff, you know, all together. Silhouette is, uh, now when you're talking about silhouette, is basically it does mean the shape, okay? So we we'll start with the line, right? We all know that, oh, line is like super important and uh, <laughs> I, I and like, we are all like line lovers, you know, like the force guys, especially. So you are focusing on the line like really, really hard. But, you know, as we are like moving to the shape, uh, moving to the form and then to the shape, the line is actually acting in the service of the shape. OK, so we basically say that the line is not the king anymore. And now it's uh, basically servicing the shape. 
So for example, uh, if I'm drawing like some lines in here, if I'm like start to draw some like shapes, basically what is shape? You know, shape is just like the uh, area enclosed within the line. Okay, so if I, let's say if I do this, well, it will still be considered a line, but if I, as soon as I close this up, well, see the area enclosed within, um, that's the shape for me, okay? So there we go. Uh, that is now a shape. So basically the line, okay, you really have to focus on the line like really, really hard, you know, because you wanna get the lines pretty good. And they are uh, the basic building blocks of the shapes. But now when you're in the shape, you need to understand that that line is, um, is in the service of the shape, okay? So that's the first component. Uh, getting into shapes, well, shapes are 2D, okay? This is one uh, difference that uh, usually people get confused within the volumes and the shapes. You know, shapes are 2D and the volumes are 3D, you know? So, you know, here, see, like these are the volumes and uh, well, these are the shapes, you know? So any, any types of like 2D shape or basically the silhouette that you're watching is, um, you know, these are the shapes, okay? Now we uh, named quite a like uh, a few ones, right? But we cannot like uh, is there like mil uh, multiple multiple or we can say like infinite shapes out there. We cannot name everyone, but uh, you know here they are. Basically the circles, the triangles, the, the pentagon. You know <laughs> you want to go like too mathematical or scientific, right? But uh, they basically uh, if you just turn them into a three dimensional uh, structure, right? They basically becomes volumes, okay? So here we are, you now we have a cylinder, we have a sphere, we have a cube, you know, all these kind of volumes. Now, um, well, what is a shape, right? Like, uh, look, okay, what is a good shape? Like, well, we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, a good shape is like a, um, you, can, you can call them the first, like the non, uh, like the asymmetrical shapes, okay? <laughs> you don't wanna get in like the symmetrical shapes, like they're, uh, they're not really the, the kind of like worth it, you know? So these are, the kind of symmetrical shape that we uh, we talked about, these are not really good. You see, like all of these are just the mirror image of both of these, okay? And one of the major factors, uh, like why these are not the good shapes, the first thing is uh, this is not how force works in real life, okay? <laughs> the force always works in this like zigzag, zigzag, zigzag pattern, okay? You see like how symmetrical it is and it's always like working in this like zigzag pattern. That's, a, that's one of the main reasons like why none of the, uh, symmetrical shapes actually looks good. They are shapes, but they're not the good shapes. Okay, see that one, right? Here, uh, the force is like going out, by the way. We, we've covered like in this in detail on like many other streams, uh, but we're gonna be specifically talking about like uh, how you can give your primitives a forceful shape, okay? Or how you can convert those primitives into a forceful volume to finally use into the figure drawing, okay? So just to understand that, um, Symmetrical shapes are bad, okay? You don't want to get into like a symmetrical design. And uh, um, let's see how we can convert that to an, into a forceful volumes, okay? All right, now, so finally we get the symmetry, uh, finally we get the primitives or the basic forms out of like Mike's, uh, you know, awesome presentation, it's Lee's awesome presentation. Now we can finally just uh, move into uh, converting this, right? Our final goal is this one right here, <laughs> okay? So, uh, these are the three three steps that we follow in general, you know, to just, uh, you know, convert a primitive, a normal looking primitive, just like this, into a forceful primitive, okay, like this. So the first step is usually, like you have the primitive like this, okay, so this is, I'm taking a cylinder here, just like a very normal cylinder. Um, now, and uh, also, by the way, you get to tone them in, right? Because now you're finally into the shape. I'm just gonna tone that a little bit lighter. Yeah, you're finally into the shape, you know? So in shape, your biggest biggest tool that you can ever use is like toning in, okay? Because now you you have you have the habit of like looking at the silhouette, okay? See, if I remove this, yeah, it's the very bad looking silhouette right now. It's not clean enough, but you get the idea. It's like, like it can, okay, right here. So anyway, um, so we finally get this, by the way. Then you want to taper it down, okay? Like because this is how the, uh, you know, you what you would say like this is how the concentration actually works. The concentration of means that you are really like making the viewer focus, okay? Like here, and these are all the basic anatomy shapes. By the way, you would see like the thigh. Uh, let's say for example, the thighs, right? 
the thighs are like this, they're like wide, okay, at the at the beginning. And as the leg goes down, you know, it goes like more tapered and tapered, okay. So as the as the as it approaches the end, it just uh, is the more tapered form, okay. If we just take the lower leg, for example, see, it is tapered down. Hmm? Same with that. Same so this, with the arm. Hmm? This is a really important thing that Mertenje is talking about here, everyone. You know, just to make sure you're paying attention, right? Like, we, you know, we start force at the torso, right? Because it's like the largest mass of the body. And if you just imagine the torso, and then you attach arms and legs. You basically have this uh, pinched tube that Mutenje drew, and the understanding is that things start wide at the core of the body, right, at the torso, and they funnel their way down, literally like a funnel, right? They funnel their way down from big through the knee or elbow to medium to small at the wrist or the ankle, right? So keep that in mind, you know, and if you're a character designer, like you can invert that, right? There's tons of character designs where they go wide, you know, for instance, uh, Hellboy's hand, right, with a big fist or... Sometimes character designers will make the boots like really huge, right? You'll go from the knee and then make the ankle really wide because it's like a giant boot. But in general, as a as for human anatomy, you know, you go from big to medium down to small, and that that's a very important thing to be aware of because that'll help us create better shapes. Yes, yeah, yeah that, that's for sure. <laughs> Pay attention, guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, all right, so. Finally, uh, what do we what do we want, right? We want to like taper it down, okay? It, it just basically like sends all the force, you know, down to this like point. Uh, imagine it like a water, okay? And so let's say you have water, you know, if you if you made it fall through this, you know, like it's gonna be the same uh, same path, you know. And this is the reason why there's like the nozzles and things like that, which are uh, have this like tapered uh, tapered end, you know, to like make the water pressure like more forceful, okay? Because and I get like, let's say all the water in there and just, yeah, it's going to get concentrated, right? All the strength there is going to get concentrated. So uh, in general, what you want to do is make your primitives go from this, okay? Like this, let's say a cylinder here, all the way to a taper cylinder, okay? Like this. Now this is uh, the one that are darkening, like this edge is towards us, by the way, okay? So yeah, there we go. Now, the final step, you know, it's a three-step process and not like a big, like, uh, like big process or something like that. It's very simple. All you just got to do is taper it down and then add a bend to it, okay? So if I'm adding a bend to it, see what happens, okay? Just like this, you know? So I'm adding a bend to it and there we go. But now uh, the thing to remember is you're uh, you're using the straight to curve design, okay, which we actually talk in the shape section. So you know you uh, basically a shape, a forceful shape is made out of a curve and a straight. By the way, you know we call it like lemon slice or D or you know, there's so many metaphors you know that been been using like all across all three. Uh, but this is how a forceful shape works, you know. But just because uh, this is called a forceful shape because um, you need like both, you know, in figure drawing, let's say if you, if you, uh, if I explain it through the figure drawing, it's basically, you want like curves, okay, which is going to give you, give you the fluidity, okay. Here I'm doing a really quick sketch here, by the way. Let's say I'm doing this. This is what we call spaghetti figures, you know, and it's, it's definitely very, very important in the beginning for sure. You basically like make everything through curves, you know, see, there's nothing in, there's no straight in here, okay. So, which means that it's got like no support, okay? <laughs> uh, but it's good, you know, it, and this is important by the way as well that, you know, you get this uh, first uh, at the beginning of your early stage. So you want to get that confidence and get that flow inside of your hand. And then you like move on to the structure side of things. But if I if I say that, oh, you know, I'm just going to make everything out of straight, if the curves don't work, if the curves don't represent the reality, if I make everything out of straight, would that work? Here I'm adding the curves, but <laughs> yeah, these are the, like the straight, right? You would end up with a dead drawing, okay? You don't want this either. Hmm? See, right there, right there, right there. <laughs> okay, so you, you want both, right? You want both of them. Let's combine them both. So basically uh, what we are doing is, oh, we want to add like straights in the areas where it's needed. Okay, for example, in the spine, right? The rule came out to be, uh, I mean, uh, this is how it came out to be. You want to use like straights against the curves, okay? 
If you have like one curve, you definitely have a straight on the other side, okay? So a curve is always supported by a straight and this is how uh, a D came out, okay? This is what we call like a forceful shape. But it, uh, the straight doesn't have to be literally a, a, literally a um, straight, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be like this always, all the time, okay? You can actually have it more like this as well. So sometimes it's, you can, you can like curve it a little bit like this, okay? So it, it will still be a forceful shape, okay? And this will still be considered a straight side and this will be a curved side, okay? Just because the straight is not like dominating, okay? It's not like dominating the main curve. So yeah, this is still our straight, okay? And this is still our curve, okay? All you just wanna make sure you don't do this, okay? <laughs> So uh, this is all right, okay? But you, you don't wanna do this, by the way, right? As soon as this uh, straight start to compete with the main curve, well, that's when the problem starts to happen, okay? Then this doesn't, uh, it's on a danger level now. Okay, so using all that information, you know, coming back to this, all I'm doing is adding a curve here, okay? And this is also a curve, as you can see, it's not, it's not looking like this, by the way. So curve and a straight. So I'm not literally using a straight here. You can use that for sure. You know, this will still be a forceful shape, a forceful volume here. But I know if I'm adding a little bit curve to it, which is lost your audio, Martin J. I don't know. Swan did you lose his audio? Uh yeah, I think it got stuck. Internet problems, perhaps. Yeah, I lost them too. Let's see, and we're almost at the end. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up where he left off. There's a couple of things I want to make sure you guys know before we leave today. Let's see. I'm going to grab this. So I'm going to pick up where Matunjay left off and say, um, what I want you guys to leave here with understanding today is that this this um a couple of things just to be really quick right it's it's better to taper than to not taper right first of all right like you want to go like this okay and we want to keep that form in there right we came from form today so this is actually a cone in a sense right so we have a cone and if i wanted to improve a tube right so let's say here's a tube if I wanted to improve a tube and get it to have force in it, well, doing this isn't good enough because that leads me to a shape that is parallel on both sides, right? You'll see like this is lining up with this. So that's not really that good either. So even when you have a tube, really what you're trying to do with the tube is manipulate it back into a cone, right? A pyramid is actually very close to a cone, but it's got hard corners. The cone is rounded, right? So you could get more angular. You know, you could have a pyramid and say, you know, already the pyramid is going to pinch down also, right? It's going to be like this. So that's kind of doing the job too. We just have some sharper corners of it. So why is this also important? Because really what we do want to try to get to is, is this kind of form, right? This kind of form or volume with this kind of silhouette, right? And this guy, this is the winning form slash shape that I was referencing at the beginning of today's session, right? Like this guy is the winner. Because, you know, we can go draw the human figure and, you know, we have our, um, we have that torso that Mutunje was drawing before, right? It's like this. And after I have that and I move down from arms to arms and legs, well, you know what? I've got that leg. Sure, it's a tube, right? Like this, or I should say a cone, right? It's a cone, but it's got that good shape in it. You see, All right? So now it's got volume and good silhouette, right? Volume and silhouette. And that's what we wanna leave you with today. I could do it here. Uh, I could do it on the arms, right? So arms and legs are basically solved today, quite frankly, right? And it's kind of right here too. You'll notice on the torso, I can have the curve of the back versus the front. It's like a giant cone, right? 
And then with arms, you know, I usually draw the shoulder as a curve with a straight for the bottom of the deltoid. So it's like a muscle that's tubular. And then an arm works like that as well, right? You have like the length of the arm, like so, and it's straight, right? And it's tubular, you know, maybe I'm saying it's going away from me like this. Um, and then I can add the anatomy on top of that. You know, you kind of tack on the shapes and the forms of the anatomy thereafter. Right? It's like, oh, here's the brachial radialis. You say, maybe we've got a little bit of tricep action going on here. Right? You get that deltoid coming into the middle and then this is gonna hook up to the scapula, right? But this all works, right? And it works really well. And if you look at our drawings, Swanley Mutunje and I, and it's shaped, it's got silhouette, that's what we're doing right? Such a darn powerful form with great silhouette, right? So to recap, you got to know perspective. You got to learn how to, you know, take a box and rotate it in space because that also leads you to rotating primitives or forms in space. And then once you get those forms, the way to kick some force into those forms is to bend them but bending isn't typically enough. The trick is to bend and make sure that you got a wide opening on one side and a narrow opening on the other. So you're kind of creating a squeeze like Matunje was talking about. So you can get the bend and the squeeze, right? In there together, right? So we've got bend, right? And I've got big to small and I got squeeze. I shove in that straightish line on the other side. Boom, there's the answer, right? So that's the shape slash form that you really want to use across the arms and legs and even the torso. And this goes down to eyebrows, okay? Hair, we were talking about hair in the chat a little today, right? It comes down to everything. This is like the global answer, right? So today we just tried to take you in understanding what the steps are from form to finally get to this place, okay? All right, guys, so um, thank you for hanging out with Swanley Matunje and I today. Uh, we will see you next Friday. Enjoy your uh, Christmas shopping. I think Hanukkah is coming right around the corner this upcoming week as well for those of you that celebrate Hanukkah. Um, and we will see you next Friday, okay, with another uh, session that hopefully is valuable to you. Um, I want to leave again with don't forget that we're having this mentorship sale. Uh, you know, check out the website. These are the coupon codes if you go for the 12 session packages or you go for the 36 session package. We really do hope to get to teach you um, individually in the year 2023. Okay. Take care, guys. Thanks again, Swan Lane. Thanks, Mutunje. And uh, we'll all see you Friday. Bye bye. See you guys. Okay. We're out. No, what happened to Matunjin?